something under the surface. Not to omit an occurrence of considerable interest, we must needs here present some account of a curious retinue of fish, which overtook our chamois a day or two after parting with the canoe. A violent creaming and frothing in our rear announced their approach. Soon we found ourselves in the nucleus of an incredible multitude of finny creatures, mostly anonymous. First, far in advance of our prow, swam the helmeted silverheads, side by side, in uniform ranks, like an army. Then came the bonitas, with their flashing blue flanks. Then, like a third distinct regiment, wormed and twisted through the water, like Archimedean screws, the quivering wriggle-tails, followed in turn by the rank and file of the trigger-fish, so called from their quaint dorsal fins being set in their backs with a comical curve, as if at half-cock. Far astern the rear was brought up by an endless battalion of yellow backs, right martially vested in buff. And slowly sailing overhead were flights of birds, a wing in the air for every fin in the sea. But let the sea-fowls fly on, we turned the fish. Their numbers were amazing, countless as the tears shed for perfidious lovers. Far abroad on both flanks, they swam in long lines, tier upon tier, the water alive with their hosts, locusts of the sea peradventure, going to fall with a blight upon some green, mossy province of Neptune. And tame and fearless they were, as the first fish that swam in Euphrates, hardly evading the hand, insomuch that Samoa caught many, without lure or line. They formed a decorous escort, paddling along by our barnacled sides, as if they had been with us from the very beginning, neither scared by our crafts surging in the water, nor in the least sympathetic at losing a comrade by the hand of Samoa. They closed in their ranks and swam on. How innocent yet heartless they looked! Had a plank dropped out of our boat, we had sunk to the bottom, and belike, our cheerful retinue would have paid the last rites to our remains. But still we kept company, as sociably as you please, Samoa helping himself when he listed, and Yilla clapping her hands as the radiant creatures, by a simultaneous turning round on their silvery bellies, caused the whole sea to glow like a burnished shield. But what has befallen this poor little Benita astern, that he swims so toilingly on, with gills showing purple? What has he there towing behind? It is tangled sea kelp clinging to its fins. But the clogged thing strains to keep up with its fellows. Yet little they heed. Away they go, every fish for itself, and any fish for Samoa. At last the poor Bonita is seen no more. The myriad fins swim on, a lonely waste, where the lost one drops behind. Strange fish! All the live-long day they were there by our side, and at night still tarried and shone more crystal and scaly in the pale moonbeams than the glowing glare of the sun. How prettily they swam, all silver life, darting hither and thither between their long ranks, and touching their noses, and scraping acquaintance. No mourning they wear for the bonetta left far astern, nor for those so cruelly killed by Samoa. No, no, all is glee, fishy glee, and frolicking fun, light hearts and light fins, gay backs and gay spirits, swim away, swim away, my merry fins all. Let us roam the flood, let us follow this monster fish with the barnacled sides, this strange-looking fish, so high out of water, that goes without fins. What fish can it be? What rippling is that? Dost hear the great monster breathe? Why, tis sharp at both ends, a tail either way, nor eyes has it any nor mouth. What a curious fish, what a comical fish, but more comical far, those creatures above on its hollow back, clinging there too like the snaky eels that cling and slide on the back of the swordfish, are terrible foe. But what curious eels these are! Do they deem themselves pretty as we? No, no, for sure. They behold our limber fins, our speckled and beautiful scales. Poor powerless things! How must they wish they were we that roam the flood and scour the seas with a wish? Swim away! Mary Finn, swim away. Let him drop, that fellow that halts. Make a lane, close in, and fill up. Let him drown, if he cannot keep pace. No laggards for us. We fish, we fish, we merrily swim. We care not for friend nor for foe. Our fins are stout, our tails are out, as through the seas we go. 
Fish, fish, we are fish with red gills, not disturbs us, our blood is at zero. We are buoyant because of our bags being many, each fish is a hero. We care not what is it, this life, that we follow this phantom unknown. To swim, it's exceedingly pleasant, so swim away, making a foam. This strange-looking thing by our side, not for safety, around it we flee. Its shadow's so shady, that's all, we only swim under its lee. And as for the eels there above, and as for the fowls in the air, we care not for them nor their ways, as we cheerily glide afar. We fish, we fish, we merrily swim, we care not for friend nor for foe. Our fins are stout, our tails are out, as through the seas we go. But how now, my fine fish, what alarms your long ranks, and tosses them all into a hubbub of scales and of foam? Never mind that long knave with the spear there astern. Pipe away, merry fish, and give us a knave or two more, keeping time with your doggerel tails. But no, no, their singing was over. Grim death, in the shape of a chevalier, was after them. How they changed their boastful tune! How they hugged the vilified boat! How they wished they were in it, the braggarts! And how they all tingled with fear! For now here, now there, is heard a terrible rushing sound under water, betokening the onslaught of the dread fish of prey, that with spear ever in rest, charges in upon the outskirts of the shoal, transfixing the fish on his weapon. Retreating and shaking them off, the chevalier devours them, then returns to the charge. Hugging the boat to desperation, the poor fish fairly crowded themselves up to the surface and floundered upon each other, as men are lifted off their feet in a mall. They clung to us thus, out of a fancied security in our presence. Knowing this, we felt no little alarm for ourselves, dreading lest the chevalier might despise our boat, full as much as his prey, and in pursuing the fish, run through the poor chamois with a lunge. A jacket, rolled up, was kept in readiness to be thrust into the first opening made, while as the thousand fins audibly patted against our slender planks, we felt nervously enough, as if treading upon thin, crackling ice. At length, to our no small delight, the enemy swam away, and again by our side merrily paddled our escort, ten times merrier than ever. End of chapter 48